William Lane Craig is a philosopher and theologian and is known for having some of the most powerful arguments for the existence of God. This is the deepest question of philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? And today we'll present Craig's strongest arguments for God and reveal something shocking about the universe itself. Let's get right into it. In his 2013 article titled, Does God Exist? Craig talks about something called natural theology. But what's that? Simply put, it's the attempt to prove God's existence without relying on supposed revelations, just using philosophical arguments. Craig is keen on two classic arguments, the cosmological, that is, how the universe began, and the design argument, or how the universe seems designed. He believes there's a renewed interest in these arguments and even throws in some new ones. Now, Craig argues that there's a renaissance of Christian philosophy, particularly in the USA, and claims that his new arguments have been overlooked by the new atheists like Richard Dawkins and company. And when confronted by atheists, Craig's response is quite amazing. Just have a look at this. God is the best explanation for why anything at all exists, rather than nothing. God is the best explanation of the beginning of the universe. God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. God is the best explanation of the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And finally, God can be personally known and experienced. Craig's first reason for God's existence is straightforward. God is the best explanation for why anything at all exists. But is it really that simple? Craig assumes that every event must have an explanation. However, modern physics, especially with quantum mechanics, challenges this notion. Events at the atomic level, like the emission of an alpha particle, can be causeless, lacking a definite explanation. So Craig's assumption that every event requires an explanation falls apart. In essence, asserting that God is the best explanation becomes a metaphysical claim, going beyond what science can validate. Scientists may need to accept that the universe may not have a definitive explanation, and that challenges Craig's premise. Craig propels himself into the assertion that the explanation for the universe is a transcendent personal being that not only necessarily exists, but also, according to Craig, wanted to create the universe. How does he reach this conclusion? Well, he argues that for this being to want to create, it must be conscious, thus making it a personal being. But let's hit pause and restart with fairness. Craig's approach, according to critics, is flawed because he assumes the universe exists, framing the problem as finding an explanation for it. The fair way to tackle the question, why does anything at all exist, is to begin with the assumption that nothing exists. No universe, no beings of any sort. Then we confront a logical challenge. Any starting point we choose won't have an explanation because, well, it's the starting point. But here's where it gets really interesting. So, what sort of explanation could the universe have? Well, it seems plausible that three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external, transcendent, personal cause. Now, let's dive a little deeper into this. Number one, the complex beginning. The greatest possible mind, capable of anything, conjuring matter into existence and meticulously planning the future of the universe. Supposedly, this mind did it all for us. However, critics argue that our experience shows minds emerging from and depending on matter, not the other way around. The atheist's simpler starting point, a mindless material universe with a potential for evolving life and mind on at least one planet, that is, considering the multitude of Earth-like planets we now know exist. Imagine something popping into existence without further explanation. It seems more reasonable with the simple than the complex. Although the universe is currently complex with stars, planets and life, the atheist perspective asserts that complexity arose from a very simple beginning. Physics in this view unfolds from one fundamental law without consciousness or intention. It's a perspective that sees mind as a product of matter following the laws of physics. But there is something more important to discuss here. Number two, the Kalam cosmological argument. As the argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, 
the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Craig is eager to establish that the universe had a beginning, as he firmly believes that everything starting must have a cause. However, the debate on whether time is finite or infinite is within the realm of physics. Roger Penrose, in his 2012 Conway Memorial Lecture, proposed a theory called conformal cyclic cosmology, suggesting a cyclical nature of the universe, reminiscent of Fred Hoyle's steady state cosmology from 1956. Both theories imply an eternal universe. Penrose claims there's astronomical evidence supporting events from cycles preceding our known Big Bang, challenging the idea of being the universe's origin. But here's where things get really amazing. Number three, God is the best explanation for all mathematics and physics. How is it that a mathematical theorist like Peter Higgs can sit down at his desk and by poring over mathematical equations predict the existence of a fundamental particle which experimentalists 30 years later after investing millions of dollars and thousands of man hours are finally able to detect? Here, Craig argues that the successful application of mathematics to the world is too precise to be random, attributing it to divine design. However, this notion misunderstands the nature of mathematics and its application. Historical examples like Ptolemy's geocentric model show that different mathematical systems can be applied to describe the world. Copernicus, unsatisfied with the geocentric model's discrepancies, proposed a heliocentric model introducing a different mathematical system. Later, Kepler's use of ellipses improved accuracy. The key point is that adjustments to mathematical systems, rather than a divine plan, allowed for more accurate descriptions. This challenges Craig's argument that only God could design a world inclined to mathematical description. In the 18th century, Kant and others believed the universe's geometry was Euclidean, with a triangle having 180 degrees. However, Einstein's gravity theory in 1915 suggested a non-Euclidean geometry where space is curved. Mathematicians had already developed various non-Euclidean geometrics, and Einstein found one aligning with his theory. The lesson here is that we construct mathematics to fit data and every possible physical world has a principled structure with a corresponding mathematical representation. Mathematicians, through imagination and creativity, draw from an infinite platonic realm containing all possible structures. The realm of mathematics is not controlled by God and there is no mystery requiring divine explanation. But let's take a pause for a moment because it's about to get a lot more interesting. Number four, the fine-tuning argument. This argument has undergone a significant shift. Traditionally, proponents of supernatural design cited life on Earth as evidence. However, Darwin's theory of evolution challenged this. As scientific understanding progressed, the notion that inanimate matter required a life force also crumbled. Advances like the synthesis of the first organic compound in 1834 and the elucidation of DNA structure in 1953 eroded the belief in a distinct divine being living and non-living matter. The argument then shifted to claiming that the material world was precisely formulated for life. Apologists now ask us to envision God before time began, adjusting cosmic constants like the speed of light or gravity. This fine-tuning argument contends that these adjustments are necessary for life as we know it. Craig invites us to imagine God fine-tuning cosmic constants independently to create a universe conducive to life. However, contemporary multiverse theories like string theories propose the existence of countless parallel universes with different constants. In most of these universes, life would not have evolved. This challenges the notion of fine-tuning, suggesting that we inhabit a universe where life could naturally evolve, rendering the need for fine-tuning unnecessary. The multiverse concept provides an alternative explanation, one that doesn't require God as the orchestrator of specific cosmic conditions. Craig's view implies that God predetermined the entire evolution of the universe, starting from an infinitely dense point to produce life after 13.8 billion years, this suggests that the initial conditions of the universe had to possess infinite precision for this outcome. However, the deterministic viewpoint faces challenges from quantum physics, which introduces indeterminism through various random events. Even for God, overcoming the inherent unpredictability of quantum physics would be a demanding task, requiring constant intervention to ensure the desired outcome. 
This raises significant theological questions about God's control and involvement in the universe. Now, if you thought that argument was incredible, just wait until you hear the next part. Number five, God is the best explanation of consciousness. One, if God did not exist, intentional states of consciousness would not exist. Two, but intentional states of consciousness do exist, from which it follows logically three, therefore God exists. Craig's argument hinges on the idea that only a mind can think about things. He asserts that minds, being more than mere matter, are a special gift from God. However, an alternative perspective suggests that minds and intentional states of consciousness are products of natural selection. Observing animal behavior, particularly invertebrate monkeys, showcases the origins of intentional states linked to survival instincts. The capacity for intentionality began with the formation of associations in animal brains vital for survival long before consciousness fully developed. This challenges the notion that intentional states are exclusive gifts from God. Number six, God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties. Craig argues that God provides an objective basis for moral values and duties. He contrasts this with secular views, asserting that without God, moral values become subjective opinions. However, the secular perspective argues that moral values can be objective in the sense that certain actions cause pain while others cause pleasure. The subjective aspect lies in our individual opinions about these facts. Values being subjective don't fit neatly into categories of true or false. Critics challenge Craig's stance, questioning why God's view is considered objectively right, pointing out that grounding morals in God's commands raises the Euthyphro dilemma. Is something good because God commands it, or does God command it because it is good? Well, we'll leave that question open for now because there is something much more important that we need to discuss. Number seven, the very possibility of God's existence implies that God exists. So what that means is that if God exists in any possible world, then it has to exist in every possible world. Craig delves deeply here into the ontological argument, suggesting that God is a maximally great being and according to Anselm's formulation, must exist in every logically possible way. However, this argument faces scrutiny. Critics question the validity of defining existence as a quality challenging the idea that every superlative quality must correspond to a hypothetical being. This leads to absurd conclusions, such as the existence of a wickedest being. Immanuel Kant rejected Anselm's argument, emphasizing that existence cannot be added as a property to a possible being through mere verbal manipulation. The attributes of God, as defined by Anselm and Craig, raise internal contradictions. Questions arise about God being all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good, despite the existence of pain, suffering, and the concept of hell. These internal conflicts within the attributes of God challenge the coherence of such a being. If God contains internal contradictions, it becomes an unsuitable candidate for existence in any possible world, rendering logical proof of God's existence unlikely. But there is still one more problem we have not addressed. Number 8. God can be personally known and experienced. In the same way, belief in God is for those who seek him a properly basic belief grounded in our experience of God. Now, if this is so, then there's a danger that arguments for God could actually distract our attention from God himself. The Bible promises, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes a personal reality in their lives. Craig introduces personal experiences of God as a reason for belief. However, he acknowledges that this is not an argument, but rather a statement about personal encounters. Critics argue that religious experiences are diverse and tied to cultural contexts. They emphasize that personal, private experiences have psychological causes, making them insufficient evidence for the validity of any particular religion. The interplay between genetics and the environment, starting from the prenatal period, significantly shapes individuals. The concept of free will is explored within the context of determinism, 
While Craig's arguments often presuppose a libertarian form of free will, they also suggest a form of determinism is essential for decision-making and the functioning of free will. The crisis for religion is identified in a clash between traditional Christian views of free will and the implications of determinism. Compassion and logical reasoning rooted in science might play a more prominent role in shaping our views on morality. This shift could potentially pose challenges for traditional religious doctrines in the future. It's important to consider these ideas with an open mind, recognizing the complexity of the topics and the ongoing dialogue between philosophy, theology and science. The quest for understanding continues and perspectives may evolve as we explore these intriguing aspects of human existence.